Thank you everybody for joining us today. We have a lot of people signing on, so I'm gonna start the introduction in the next 30 seconds here. I just wanna give everyone a chance to sign on to, um, before we get started. Okay. Hello and welcome everybody to our webinar entitled Coronaviruses SARS-CoV-2 Update for Clinical Laboratories hosted by Wiley and the American Society for Microbiology Press. We are very excited you're joining us today for this webinar on a very important topic applicable to any clinical laboratory who wants to stay up to date on SARS-CoV-2 since the start of the pandemic almost a year and a half ago. I'm Ellen Fox, Managing Developmental Editor of ClinMicronaut ASM Press. ClinMicronaut.org now includes an updated coronavirus chapter from the Manual of Clinical Microbiology 13th edition, the chapter around which this webinar is based. This chapter was published at ClinMicronaut on August 2nd, and it's the second critical update to this chapter since the start of the pandemic. Before I hand this presentation over to our excellent speakers, I wanted to note that you are all in listen-only mode to cut out any background noise. However, we invite you to type your questions in the question box in your control panel so that the presenters can address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. This session is being recorded, and if in a few days' time, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording. Additionally, you can find a copy of the slides in the handout section of the webinar panel. So without further ado, let me hand the presentation over to our speakers today, Dr. Benjamin Pinsky, Assistant Professor of Pathology and Medicine at Stanford University of Medicine and Director of the Clinical Virology Laboratory for Stanford Healthcare and Stanford Children's Health, and Dr. Hiba Mustafa, who is currently Assistant Professor of Pathology and Director of the Molecular Virology Section in the Medical Microbiology Laboratory at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Thank you, and Dr. Pinsky, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Ellen. Um, we're going to give a review of uh, what we've updated on this chapter. Haba and I are co-authors on this chapter for MCM. Um, and in addition, we'll give some uh, updates on what's going on with the pandemic and things that we think are important topics and hopefully will stimulate some discussion with the attendees. So thank you all for joining um, and I'll get started. So as was mentioned, the coronavirus chapter is on ClinMicro now, and the link to the chapter uh, is, is listed there in the handout um, and on this slide. So uh, please check that out if you haven't already. And I wanna give special thank yous to Naomi Gadsby and Kate Templeton. They were the original authors of this chapter and covered uh, the other coronaviruses, non-SARS-CoV-2 although Haba and I uh, updated uh, those sections a bit as well, but they did excellent work on the original chapter. And then also special thanks to Marie Landry for trying to keep me on track and get these updates in on, on time, which I struggled to do. All right, so what, sex, what have we updated? Uh, we've done a lot of work on this chapter since the last version, and as you all know, um, things change so rapidly throughout the course of this pandemic. Um, so here's the sections that were updated uh, for description of the agent. We added a discussion about the origins of SARS-CoV-2, which of course is a, still a somewhat controversial topic. Uh, for epidemiology and transmission, uh, we added a section on evolution and variants, which was not in the first. Um, update and Heba is going to talk in a lot more detail about genomic surveillance in the second part of this uh, talk. Uh, we updated clinical significance with uh, the therapeutics including talk, um, uh, information about remdesivir, corticosteroids, and monoclonal antibody therapies. Uh, for prevention of course we added a section on vaccines. Uh, direct detection required a large update as the diagnostics um, 
continue to uh, increase and change. Uh, so you can see all the sections that were added there. And of important note, please um, take a look at the tables. Uh, Haber did an excellent job uh, really updating those and they're very, very detailed. And then for uh, serologic tests, uh, that section was also updated. So please take a look at the chapter. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly talk about some of the things that I think are, are new in SARS-CoV-2. Um, these are, th I think, the three main uh, newer or ongoing discussions that we've been having in clinical virology and uh, clinical microbiology. Uh, cycle threshold values, which I will touch on, uh, variants of concern, including Delta and what's coming next, which uh, Heba will discuss. And then I think perhaps you can invite us back um, when we start to talk about correlates of immune correlates of protection uh, after both infection and vaccination. I don't have anything on that right now, but that is certainly a topic um, at top of mind for many folks. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about cycle threshold values. Um, so as you know, all current CoV-2 NATs are authorized only for qualitative interpretation. Um, and however, as of December 10th in 2020, uh, the FDA stated that CT values may be reported by the clinical laboratory in addition to qualitative interpretation. Um, so I'll briefly editorialize that I'm not sure what the uh, FDA is doing in this regards. Um, however, um, this has sort of gone under the radar with, um, at least in the general sense, uh, because of all the other issues that they continue to have. But we will discuss about cycle threshold values. Um, so what are they? I think the audience knows, but I'll just review. The cycle number, these are the cycle number at which real-time PCR fluorescence curves cross at the detection threshold. Show, so on the left uh, here, I'm showing um, uh, a standard curve actually for the Berlin or WHO protocol for the envelope gene uh, reverse transcription uh, qPCR. And as you know, the lower the CT value, the higher the viral burden, so the further to the left here. And also that quantitation requires a calibrator to convert to copies per volume of specimen uh, or copies per reaction or international units as we get to that uh, stage. So there's a lot of considerations, I think, for use of CT values in clinical practice that's worth uh, discussing and reminding everyone. Um, so the first important point is that the amount of detectable viral RNA in a clinical specimen is impacted by an enormous number of variables. And these include the specimen collection method. Um, and we, throughout the course of this pandemic, we've gone through enormous amounts of discussion about uh, various specimen collections and specimen sources, which is the next one. Uh, the transport media type and the volume that the specimen is collected in. Um, importantly, the duration from specimen collection to the time of analysis and things can and do degrade. And then the days from infection or onset of symptoms to specimen collection. And certainly the viral load uh, or viral burden decreases uh, over time during the course of infection. The second major point is that CT values can vary significantly both between and within uh, RT-PCR methods. And this was demonstrated quite clearly in College of American Pathologists proficiency testing data, which has been published. And then the third one, uh, there is at the moment at least no international commutable quantitative reference standard material that can be used to harmonize assays across laboratories. Uh, so, of course, there's a number of groups, um, including including the Coronavirus Standards Working Group that's trying to put together uh, uh, an international unit for quantitative testing. Um, and this would certainly be helpful um, to harmonize assays, uh, harmonize across different assays. And now uh, there's something like 250 or perhaps more uh, emergency use authorized tests in the United States and certainly more being used across the world. And we know that uh, quantitative reference standards are at least one uh, essential part of harmonization and there's enormous amounts of work that's been done 
um, showing this, particularly in recent years for transplant viruses, um, as well as in, in past times for HIV and uh, hepatitis. So this is something that we know how to do, um, and hopefully this will come if we'd like to use quantitative testing uh, for COVID-2. So with the idea that we can uh, address some of these uh, variables, um, there are potential clinical applications of CT values, and I'll just point out a couple here. So there has been publications on CT values as a prognostic biomarker, uh, for example, in hospitalized patients. In this particular study from Lars Westblade and colleagues, uh, a higher viral burden was associated with mortality and increased risk of mechanical ventilation. And there has been other studies that show this, although the data is quite mixed, I would say. And there are questions about whether these findings are general, generalizable to other uh, institutions, uh, patient populations, and also phases of the pandemic. But this is certainly something uh, CT value uh, from a respiratory specimen or viral burden from a respiratory specimen may be something that could be useful for prog prognostication. Uh, there's also been discussion of CT values as a marker for active infection or infectivity. And certainly there's a quite a number of articles that show that low CT values are associated with the ability to isolate a virus in culture. And I like this, the, I like this particular figure from, um, from Public Health England, oops, just showing um, uh, the lower the CT value, the more likely one is able to culture, uh, uh, able to isolate a virus in culture. But there is this sort of intermediate zone here between at least in their assay, uh, this range, um, where it is mixed whether one can isolate uh, a virus uh, from these specimens. And it should also be noted and has been shown um, it, uh, over, uh, in a number of papers as well that even, uh, even specimens in which the viral burden is low with late CT values, there is the ability to culture, although it's less likely. So one thing to think about um, is uh, uh, underlying all these uh, sort of uh, CT as a, um, as a transmissibil transmissibility or infectivity marker is, is whether or not cultivatability or the ability to culture is really a marker for transmissibility. And I think that remains a significant assumption, um, but it's perhaps the best measure that we have um, and this also gives me the opportunity to show some nice pictures of our uh, new BSL-3 lab, which I would say is a positive development of this pandemic, uh, led by Cla Catherine Blish, who helped get this done. And here's Arjun doing some BSL-3 work uh, with isolates from, perhaps from our lab. Uh, the most perhaps challenging part of uh, CT values are high CT values in asymptomatic individuals. Uh, the differential here includes false positives from the assay, uh, persistent post-infection shedding of viral nucleic acid, an asymptomatic infection, or uh, pre-symptomatic infection. And so it's important to note that uh, reproducible RNA detection from the same primary specimen may help rule out a technical false positive, but absence of reproducibility doesn't necessarily confirm that this is a false positive or preclude other possibilities. So we generally recommend uh, recollection and uh, testing of a new specimen uh, to identify individuals that are pre-symptomatic and that may have a viral load that's increasing. So just in my last slide, I'm gonna talk about uh, briefly some diagnostics that are being evaluated for detection of replicating COVID-2 in clinical specimens. And I want to point out that uh, Matt Vinegar has a great review of this that just came out in JCM, talking about all these uh, methods that could potentially be surrogates for culture, although they still require quite a bit more uh, research. And so here's the coronavirus life cycle. And really the most part, I mean, this is a fascinating life cycle, but one of the most interesting parts is this um, is this use of minus strand uh, templates, including uh, minus strand genomic RNA shown here that's used as a template to create the positive stranded genomic RNA that will be packaged into the virion. 
as well as the generation by discontinuous transcription or thought to be discontinuous transcription, a really interesting method to make these minus strand subgenomic RNAs. And these tack a region of the uh, five prime of the genome onto parts of the three prime of the genome where the uh, structural uh, genes are expressed. Um, so one and a number of groups have uh, attempted to use uh, the detection of subgenomic RNAs as a measure of active replication, um, as well as uh, looking for, in general, minus strand templates. And um, these may have promise, and again, I'll point you to Matt's excellent review to take a look at that. Uh, we have looked at minus strand detection or strand-specific PCR, and that has very good positive percent agreement with culture, 100%, but negative percent agreement is about in the 70s. Um, so uh, over, if we use that as a measure, uh, a surrogate for culture, we're being overcautious. Uh, so with that, I will um, thank um, everyone for listening to my section. Uh, folks in my lab who helped with this include Malay, who's a longtime uh, senior scientist in my lab, and um, Becky is one of our superstar uh, reference techs. Uh, so thank you all for your attention, and I will now hand it over to Kiba for discussion about genomic surveillance. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Ben. Um, I will switch gear a little bit. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, and I will discuss briefly the topic of SARS-CoV-2 genomic surveillance. And with the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 variants, uh, it was actually very important to add a section about uh, evolution uh, within uh, in the current chapter of the manual. Uh, so within the coronavirus family, uh, only seven human coronaviruses uh, were identified to date uh, that belong to two genera, uh, alpha and uh, beta coronaviruses. Uh, and within the seven human coronaviruses, uh, SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the subgenus Serbicovirus, which is closely related to SARS-CoV. Um, this, uh, this virus that was associated with the outbreak of SARS in 2003. And SARS-CoV-2 is like all members of the family coronavirus, um, as Ben also mentioned, it carries a large uh, RNA genome uh, that can actually reach uh, up to 32 kilobases. And this genome is a positive sense uh, RNA. Uh, and the basic structure of this genome includes a five prime two third um, that uh, encode for um, uh, the replication transcription complex. And then the remaining three-thirds of the genome uh, encode, uh, encodes up to five structural proteins that are translated from uh, those nested uh, subgenomic um, uh, mRNA, as also been uh, mentioned. Um, and this region also contains uh, additional accessory genes that are specific for particular coronaviruses. Uh, I would like to mention, though, that coronaviruses uh, encode for a protein uh, that proofreads the nascent RNA strand, and it gets rid of misincorporated nucleotides. Uh, so being uh, uh, the largest and most complex RNA virus genome, uh, this function might have been significant uh, to maintain uh, such a large genome uh, to ensure a competency of replication. Um, and just looking at the genome here, I would like to also mention that uh, different molecular assays are now available that choose different genes um, and different regions um, for diagnosis that includes uh, the N gene and E and other genes as well uh, that we listed as a part of our molecular table in the chapter. Uh, so among the seven human coronaviruses identified so far, uh, three are highly pathogenic, uh, and they likely emerged from uh, ancestral bad viruses. And the diversification of uh, uh, SARS uh, coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and MERS coronavirus from the ancestral viruses uh, was hypothesized to be through um, uh, genome recombinations. And it is actually important to, uh, uh, to understand that um, this is uh, likely what um, 
uh, defines the host range because um, uh, really the receptor recognition defines the host range. And the use of receptors uh, is really largely dependent on the receptor binding domain that, has, that is a part of the S uh, gene uh, which has been shown to be um, um, a hot spot for these recombination potentials in coronaviruses. Uh, also to mention that intermediate hosts um, facilitate the spillover of those highly pathogenic coronaviruses. Um, an intermediate uh, host that facilitated the spillover of SARS-CoV-2 is yet to be identified and confirmed, uh, though some of the genomes were shown to, uh, to be uh, recognized in the Malayan pangolins, uh, but um, uh, concerns that uh, the virus was accidentally released from a research lab has been an alternative uh, hypothesis as well. Uh, this is just to show that um, SARS-CoV um, uh, uh, was hypothesized to be the result of recombination events between uh, SARS-related bad coronaviruses. Um, and again, the most frequent recombination breakpoints have been uh, 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 within the S um, uh, gene, very important. This is what will define, again, the host uh, receptor binding and host range, and it, it con because it contains the receptor binding domain. And a critical determinant for the host range has been the binding to ACE2, uh, or angiotensin converting enzyme 2, uh, which illustrates the impact of the evolution on a changing the virus host range. For SARS-CoV-2, uh, the genome also evolved to likely enhance maybe the binding to the host cell receptor. So this figure here is showing the receptor, uh, showing the spike, um, focuses on the spike differences between SARS-CoV-2 and the closely related um, uh, SARS-CoV, um, as well as uh, pangolin and the closely related gene. And you can see that um, there were changes that um, uh, were highlighted um, within the SARS-CoV-2 spike uh, uh, receptor binding domain uh, that, uh, uh, that likely defined its uh, ability to, uh, or affinity to uh, ACE2 as a binding or host cell receptor. And uh, uh, it was also shown to actually bind with high affinity to ACE2 from other uh, animals, uh, from, from including ferrets, cats, and other species uh, that have um, high homology to the ACE2 from humans. Um, also, um, there was another notable feature uh, uh, within the SARS-CoV-2 spike, which, uh, which is the insertion of this um, bully basic um, cleavage site uh, in the junction between S1 and S2 uh, that uh, likely allows for um, effective uh, uh, cleavage by furine and other proteases and might also have a role in determining viral infectivity and host range. So that said then, uh, we know that this virus evolved with a marked ability to infect humans and to transmit efficiently as evident by this quickly devastating pandemic. Uh, but the changes in the genome of the virus are expected to happen, and hence it was essential to monitor the viral evolution since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, even though uh, we, should, we can expect that only a small minority of mutations might impact the phenotype or can possibly result in a changing the viral fitness, uh, pathogenicity or antigenicity. So since the very beginning, uh, protocols were developed uh, to allow successful whole genome sequencing. Uh, so the primary method uh, was uh, that method that was developed by the Arctic group, and it was based on covering the whole genome uh, by uh, two different pools of primers to recover the full genome, and then uh, sequencing uh, the whole genome uh, by uh, different sequencing methods uh, that uh, started earlier uh, using the nanopore uh, technology, but now different other methods are available for next generation sequencing uh, that include Illumina-based uh, sequencing as well. Uh, so not surprisingly, uh, variants were detected um, as soon as the beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, uh, you can see here, this is um, the evolution since uh, the very beginning in 2019 till now. Um, and uh, the change that actually attracted the most, most of the attention uh, initially uh, was a change in the spike, which was the aspartate to glycine, the very famous D614G. 
uh, now this has become globally dominant and it has become a part of almost all the circulating lineages and you can see that diversity increased over time but also more data accumulated over time and here you can see that our uh, variance uh, distribution uh, uh, was dif were different um, uh, within different geographical locations. You can see here that spike, the spike region showed uh, a lot of diversity also accumulated over time. So the genetic variants of SARS-CoV-2 uh, have been emerging, as we discussed, um, and circulating around the world throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. But certain variants started to attract the attention um, uh, late last year, and they were concerning because of their increased transmissibility, which warranted then um, uh, the public health authorities to uh, classify those variants. And now we have um, three main categories um, that are going from less concerning to high concerning uh, to a variant of interest, a variant of concern, and a variant of high consequence. And luckily, we don't have any variants that belong to this, um, this, to this class yet. Uh, but generally, um, uh, variants are classified uh, based on their, uh, if there is evidence of uh, impact on diagnostics or transmissibility or um, uh, 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 immune escape from previous infection or uh, vaccination. Um, and uh, uh, this has been, the variants of concern have been uh, the focus of attention and research uh, right now. Uh, but uh, should, uh, 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 I should also mention that the main uh, tracking of variants um, and the main focus has been primarily on the spike changes, which uh, which is uh, um, uh, which we can really understand based on how important this protein is for the attachment of the host cell and uh, being a target of the neutralizing antibodies and also uh, serving as the component of the widely um, distributed mRNA vaccines and vector-based vaccines. And it is um, here this um, uh, uh, the crown uh, or um, uh, what gives the coronavirus is the name is this uh, crown shaped um, um, uh, uh, view that we see with electron microscopy made by the spike protein. Uh, so understanding then the structure and important domains of the spike and the conformational changes and rearrangement that can happen within the spike to facilitate its attachment to the host cell receptor and diffusion of the virus particles with the cell uh, can then uh, help us identify uh, the changes that are expected to uh, likely impact its function. Um, so then surveillance of these mutations is very important. Um, for example, the changes um, that uh, happen within the or near the uh, ACE2 rece or receptor binding interface, those can be of particular interest as they can possibly affect the receptor binding affinity uh, and can affect also the viral fitness. Um, but luckily, most of the receptor binding interface changes so far didn't evidently show that uh, or associated with increase in clinical severity. Also, the common epitopes that can affect the binding uh, of some uh, antibodies uh, to the virus um, or have a potential to affect the vaccine responses, responses are also um, or should be monitored. But if there are any concerns along those lines, those all should be assessed experimentally. Uh, so based on the CDC classification scheme and this knowledge about the changes with expected impact, uh, the WHO and the CDC so far has listed uh, these four variants um, as variants of concern, uh, and we have inserted those tables into the current chapter. Uh, those tables will show uh, a list of the variants uh, of concern uh, shared despite changes, um, as well as uh, the area of their first isolation and the current uh, uh, nomenclature using uh, those um, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta naming schemes to replace uh, using the uh, earliest uh, um, location um, in the naming system, which is currently is discouraged. Um, and this table is showing the current variants of interest uh, as well. Um, and again, uh, you have here the um, shared, uh, within the lineage, within each lineage, the shared spike uh, protein uh, amino acid substitutions. 
And here uh, um, is the view or current view of the lineages. Uh, you can uh, surveillance is in progress by different teams all over the world. And uh, the genomes have been deposited now on large scale. Uh, so you can see how the dynamic and now how we can see the dynamic uh, replacement of different variants. Uh, you can see here that currently Delta variant is predominant globally. So this is the global view. And the US view here uh, is also showing that the Delta variant has become the um, uh, predominant uh, uh, and has replaced the Alpha variant. Um, I also wanted to share this. So this is a collective graph um, using all the data deposited into G8 so far to show the prevalence of those amino acid changes in the spike, uh, uh, which um, um, actually highlights um, um, the association of most of the changes of concerns to actually the variants of concerns. So you can see here the D614G that we mentioned earlier uh, has been the, uh, the change that happened early and established a global dominance and how it is, it has become, or it's, it's still really uh, dominant. And, uh, to, uh, in contrast to these uh, changes of concern within the spike protein, uh, that really um, took the trends of the variant of concern or variant they were associated with and then were replaced by other amino acid changes um, that were associated with other variants. And I highlighted here and read the amino acid changes that were also associated with uh, therapeutic concern, as I will mention in a minute. Uh, so, surveillance has also allowed uh, us to monitor the genomic changes that might correlate with the changes in the sensitivity to molecular diagnostics. Um, and uh, luckily, now that we have large-scale surveillance, uh, we have data uh, on mutations that can impact the primer or probe binding sites uh, of different molecular assays. But of course, this is if the primer or pr and the probe sequences are known and shared. Uh, also, I should say that we, uh, luckily, we almost all molecular assays um, target at least uh, two different genes or genomic regions, uh, which was very helpful in increasing the assays uh, sensitivity and specificity. And we have that actually highlighted as a part of our molecular diagnostics table in the chapter as well. But you can see here that um, using uh, different tools now that are available, uh, we can look at the deposited genomes and the changes uh, that can cause drift in the primer binding sites and can impact the specific uh, assays that are available and used for diagnostics. Uh, so also um, uh, the, uh, the, the um, uh, changes that happen within the genome and the variants and their impact on the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, uh, this is actually a very, very recent data uh, that shows that uh, so far um, uh, vaccines uh, look um, effective um, against the uh, currently circulating variants of concern. Uh, with a focus here on the alpha and the delta, because those were the two that uh, reached um, the highest predominance worldwide and in the US. Uh, uh, within this study, um, they actually showed that vaccines are effective um, against hospitalization in a very high rate, 95% uh, for alpha and 96% for delta. Uh, and also, um, uh, they are still effective against symptomatic disease, but maybe uh, uh, delta is a little bit compromised in this feature. Uh, also, in this other study, uh, they showed that um, the after full vaccination, um, uh, neutralizing antibodies are still uh, able to neutralize those variants, but maybe they can be um, a few folds lower uh, with uh, certain variants, including, for example, the Delta variant, if we compare it to the Alpha. Um, also, certain uh, spike substitutions were shown to have therapeutic impact and um, uh, these specific mutations or changes uh, in amino acids here uh, within the spike uh, were shown to impact um, um, the treatment with uh, or neutralization with a specific uh, monoclonal antibodies that are currently uh, uh, approved for treatment. Uh, so surveillance uh, then is very important to uh, track these uh, changes and to maybe limit the use of certain monoclonal antibodies uh, in certain locations where these uh, changes are not reported. 
uh, that said, besides all of this was really um, uh, whole genome sequencing and surveillance, but besides those um, uh, uh, approaches um, that actually target recovering the whole genome, uh, other targeted methods were also developed uh, to detect certain uh, changes within these variants. Um, uh, and maybe the most famous has been uh, the first um, uh, um, observation that uh, uh, the tag path assay, which targets the spike gene as well as two other genes, uh, started to show uh, the S or spike drop-offs or uh, S gene target failure with the wide spread of the alpha uh, variant. Uh, and actually, this was used as a tool for quick screening of the predominance of the alpha variant, but was not really intentionally developed to detect that variant. But now, uh, different companies and different groups developed uh, specific uh, targeted methods to detect the specific variants and specific mutations. Uh, however, um, the value of implementing those method methods in the lab um, uh, is, uh, is currently not really well defined because uh, uh, the correlation between identifying a specific variant and its impact on the patient's management is not, uh, is not really uh, well uh, uh, defined or clear right now. Uh, so to summarize uh, my part of the talk, um, uh, surveillance is essential for understanding the correlation of changes with uh, uh, changes that can happen within the, G within the virus uh, that can enhance transmission or cause immune escape. Uh, and from a lab perspective, um, we need to understand uh, if, there, if any mutations uh, are likely to change the sensitivity of the molecular assays. Um, and I have to highlight that uh, the, the uh, diagnostic uh, 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 microbiology laboratories have, um, have had a central role in providing real-time surveillance data. Um, uh, so thank you to all the uh, diagnostic labs. Um, and with that, I really would like to thank uh, uh, everyone who contributed to the uh, MCM chapter. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the hosts of the webinar, and uh, thank you all uh, for listening, and we can now take any questions, and don't forget to get vaccinated. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hebam Ben, for that fantastic uh, presentation. Next, we're going to move to the question and answer portion of the webinar, so I'm going to invite the presenters to turn on their cameras. We have some excellent questions come through and we're gonna have some time to answer them now. We'll try to get to as many as possible, um, but just as a reminder to please drop your questions into the question box um, or the chat if you can't find your questions and we'll get them to, to you. So the first questions for our presenters are, can you clarify what type of vaccines that you highlight in your presentation uh, regarding the vaccine effectiveness? I think this relates to uh, one of my slides. So in that, in that particular uh, um, uh, slide that I shared, uh, those, uh, this group actually tested the Pfizer and AstraZeneca, and they also tested a cohort of, uh, um, um, a cohort of uh, uh, serum from uh, previously infected patients. Uh, so these were the two vaccines that were tested in this study. Great, thank you. Um, I know we hear a lot about uh, Lambda in the news coming up too, so I wonder if either of you could ad address the, any potential issues you may see coming up with Lambda. Do you forecast it becoming a VOC? Do you think it'll stay categorized as a VOI? What are your thoughts on Lambda? Uh, go ahead, Ben. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, th I think the, the short answer is we don't really know yet. Um, so we are keeping an eye on, on the variant. We so far don't see it circulating. Um, actually, I didn't see it yet at all uh, in our geographical location. Um, so we just, um, we will wait and see. Um, it might increase, it might not increase. Ben? Right. Do you have anything yeah, to add? I completely agree with uh, Hibba's statements that uh, we need to continue to monitor, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be um, outcompeting uh, Delta. Um, we have a question from an attendee. Have the mutations been characterized that specifically impact vaccine effectiveness, such as illness, Delta variant, et cetera? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't believe so. 
Uh, so the the one change that is that has uh, been uh, uh, concerning for escape um, uh, from uh, immune responses, um, actually the the ones that I listed um, as um, uh, being or impairing the uh, uh, monoclonal antibody neutralization has been the 484K and the uh, 452R. Um, uh, but outside of this, for the vaccine responses, I'm not sure there has been any, but maybe Ben, um, can, would you like to add? I didn't, I didn't quite get the question. Could you repeat that? Oh, I'll repeat what was written. Um, I believe the uh, attendee is asking if you can correlate uh, effectiveness of vaccines with specific mutations. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certainly been studies um, uh, looking at vaccine effectiveness in populations that have a uh, large percentage of particular variants circulating. And um, certainly we've seen with a number of the variants of concern, as Hiva mentioned, um, reduced, um, reduced effectiveness. Um, most notably, I'd say with the uh, beta variant um, in a couple, in several studies that took place in South Africa. Um, the other um, the other studies looking at Delta and Alpha in particular have shown only modest reductions in vaccine uh, effectiveness um, based on both um, the based on both my, um, disease itself and also severe disease. Uh, right. So I think there is the correlation between those mutations, but um, yeah, the the true test of the vaccines comes um, with these large epidemiologic studies. We have another question. How reliable is the CT value to interpret the infectivity since the CT value can vary with different PCR kit test kits? Yeah, so I, I think that's what I was trying to get at with uh, that uh, first slide of all the pitfalls. Uh, there is quite a bit of variability in cycle threshold values um, between and within uh, tests. There's a large number of variables. Um, and as you saw with that um, graph from uh, Public Health England, and there's a number of other studies that have shown similar work. I think Habe has done some as well, showing there's kind of a, it's, it's a likelihood of, of being uh, cultivated. And then also there's this question about whether uh, isolation of a virus actually correlates with the ability to transmit. And so there's a lot of other variables there, such as duration of exposure and closeness of exposure and all those sorts of things um, that we uh, have continued to preach, you know, masking, social distancing, all that sort of stuff. So um, I, I would say it's a tricky question and we should be very cautious about using a CT value alone for that sort of um, interpretation. Right. So maybe another tricky question, what should be the minimal level of anti-spike antibody to fight the infection with COVID-19? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, short yeah, answers I, are okay. <laughs> I, I listed that on sort of the immune correlates of protection as something I think is a you know, very hot topic and something that, you know, hopefully we'll learn more about as more of these quantitative um, immunoassays are being used, but that's, super tricky and uh, we really don't know yet what is uh, a good correlate of protection. Okay, we have a question going back to PCR diagnostics. Do RT-PCR diagnostics um, such that are available across the globe, do they detect all the variants with a sensitivity of over 90 percent? Um, I believe so. I think I think most of the diagnostics we are using right now for, uh, for uh, molecular uh, detection are uh, um, actually detect uh, with very good sensitivity and as I mentioned um, uh, most of those assays actually are based on at least two different targets uh, so um, we uh, I have been uh, um, uh, using actually the the positives from my lab to characterize variants and um, uh, different variants and I see all of the variants coming from my lab so they have been detected by the, the assays we actually are using for diagnosis Right. So this next question yeah, is really I, great. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, can I, yeah, I'll just add to that. I, I completely agree with those um, statements. Um, I think that 
it's important to note that most of the assays um, don't target the regions of the genome that are on the, under the highest selective pressures. So they generally target very conserved regions that, as Haba showed in that slide, um, is being monitored by GISAID and others. And there's very limited variation under most primer probe sets. Most uh, diagnostic assays do not target spike. Um, or if they do, they're combined with another target. So I think that's important to note. But one caveat to that, I guess, is that there's so many different assays um, that I, I wouldn't be comfortable saying that all of them perform well, um, right? There's over, what I think there's over 250 authorized nucleic acid amplification tests in the US, probably um, many more in the world. So um, the ones that are commonly used, I say probably perform exceedingly well but others i think there should be a sense of caution yeah and i also would like to add that most of the companies also keep track of uh, on of their um primers and probes and make sure to send us updates on if there is a specific variant that has been circulating they usually communicate with us the likelihood of it of this variant on impacting their assay so this is also like a, um they they are actually responsible um uh, largely on this as well so this next question is excellent considering I believe we have a really large inter, a large international attendee uh, population today. Um, while sequencing is the gold standard for genomic surveillance, it's not possible for us with limited resources to regularly conduct it for all positive samples we receive. Is there, is there an alternate technique for detection by conventional PCR, real-time PCR kits often take too long to arrive and surveillance is time sensitive? Uh, so this is this is a possibility, but if it, if you are targeting a specific variant that you are looking for, so if the goal is the general surveillance to just sample and see what is circulating, um, I think we should do whole genome sequencing. If you can't sequence every single positive, I think a, a good enough sample is is should should answer your question. But then if you are then if, if you are just targeting a specific variant, there are actually methods that you can develop to identify a specific mutation or a specific variant. Uh, but in general, whole genome has been the 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 most like the it, it provides the the highest resolution to identify what is circulating. Okay. Yeah, I can Another I can add to that. I can add to that as well. Um, it, certainly the whole genome sequencing gives you the best resolution and the um, lineage calls and can identify new variants. Um, but Heba showed a slide, you know, there are targeted methods that are available to look for um, particular mutations in spike that are associated with variants of concern or variants of interest. And those could be sort of an intermediate way to understand what's happening in a population and then select um, a subset of those samples for sequencing, uh, maybe by a um, centralized public health lab in a particular country. So we actually use a targeted lab-developed uh, RT-QPCR uh, for the three most common mutations associated with variants of concern and variants of interest, which are uh, N501Y, E484K, and L452R in a multiplex and so that allows us to say um, whether um, a sample that we have is a variant of concern or variant of interest um, and then for a subset of those we can either do uh, additional confirmatory targeted pcrs like for n501y plus dell 6970 that's like 99 point something percent likely to be alpha and you can do that for basically all of the uh, variants of concern and variants of interest, um, or you can sequence a subset. So I think that that is an alternative, and there are either lab-developed protocols that are published or commercial reagents that can be used for that sort of um, approach. Um, but I think those should be used in combination uh, with, um, with uh, whole genome sequencing. Okay. Could the, uh, could the quantification of sgRNA determine virus viability? Um, actu actually, based on our data, no, uh, because we actually, um, 
try to culture a wide range of um, specimens with a wide range of CT values. And we have, we were, we were, so a wide range of CT values were actually not recovered on cell culture, starting from very low CT values of 15 and 14 to as high as 38. Uh, you have a very wide range that will give you culture negatives. So I don't think uh, this can be actually, um, um, I don't think so. Uh, I think there are multiple variables that actually control uh, the success of recovering uh, uh, infectious virus on cell cultures other than the, how much RNA you have in the specimen. Okay. Yeah, I can add to that also. Um, we've also, as I mentioned, we also, we've looked at minus strand testing, um, which primarily detects the genomic um, minus strand, not the subgenomic um, species. The subgenomic species that are primarily detectable appear to be the plus strand messages. And um, that, at least in our hands, the, the positive percent agreement with um, culture was 100%, but the negative percent agreement was 36%. Uh, so um, the RNA persists a lot longer than um, uh, in specimens that uh, um, are unable to be cultured. And there's some other data. There's a nice paper in um, JID. I can't remember the first author's name, but it's from um, University of Michigan. And they show very long persistence of subgenomic RNA after, um, after uh, um, exposure or after diagnosis. So it, it may be that that's not the best, um, the best method for that. How likely is it for uh, VOHC to emerge? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> anybody, you want to take that one? Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I think um, we don't also know. <laughs> so we better just keep the surveillance and keep track and keep the experiments running um, to make sure that if, if it shows up, we know early. Great. So we have less than yeah, 10 minutes. So we, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I agree minutes. with that. Um, I just wanted to point out um, that the, the nomenclature and the, um, the different categories keep changing. So according to the WHO, several of the uh, variants of interest have now been um, put into a new categories called alerts for further monitoring, which includes, for example, now the Epsilon variant. Uh, which was originally identified in California, which is now sort of, I guess you could say demoted or less concerning. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to keep sort of keep track of that. And then there's also sort of re-emerging uh, or not re-emerging, but other emerging lineages that have not yet been uh, categorized and that are in there. Um, one that we're currently seeing, starting to see is B1621, which has the similar mutations to beta, hmm. um, as well as an additional um, mutation in spike R346K, um, which could be important. So all these things are worth continuing to monitor and see whether they change um, in impact um, on uh, you know all those different variables that Abel was talking about, you know transmissibility, severity, and impact on vaccines and therapeutics. Are CT values lower for the Delta variant specimens compared with other variants? Is this an indication of higher viral load? Um, it actually has been shown to have higher, uh, lower CT values, um, uh, higher viral loads if you compare it to the alpha lineage, which was the predominating lineage before the Delta. Uh, so it looks like it's apparently like right now uh, there is kind of solid evidence that it has higher viral load and that might have contributed to its higher transmissibility. But for sure, it looks like there are other uh, contributors to this higher transmissibility and not merely viral load. But the answer is yes, um, it, it is actually, um, it has, it looks like it has higher viral loads. Okay, and I think we will wrap up with a question about vaccines. Um, generally, which vaccine gives a higher zero conversion and immune response following vaccination? Uh, 
I'm, I'm actually I'm actually not <laughs> where I think I think the mRNA vaccines have shown a uh, comparable um immune uh, zero conversion. This is but this is not really my area, so I I don't mm -hmm. want to give um like wrong information here. <laughs> so Ben. Um. My understanding, I, I'm not sure about uh, the zero conversion, but I think the perhaps more important question is the uh, protection at, say, um, uh, two months after or something like that. Um, I, I can't remember the exact time after vac a full vaccination where that's measured. Um, but uh, uh, I agree with Heba. I believe that the mRNA, mRNA vaccines seem to provide the highest level of protection with the um, uh, adenoviral vectored vaccines um, from Johnson & Johnson and um, AstraZeneca being sort of um, uh, slightly less effective. And then there's a lot of uh, starting to be interesting data coming out from uh, um, folks looking at the uh, Sputnik vaccine as well as um, the Sino Sinopharm vaccine uh, from China showing uh, relatively poor performance of those um, of those vaccines. So I think that's kind of at the moment the kind of the performance characteristics. Great. So we are quickly running out of time. So I would like to thank both our doctors for an informative question and answer session, and for all the excellent information you presented to the audience, and for taking the time to answer our questions today. Um, if you are interested in getting an individual or institutional subscription to ClinMicro Now, which includes all the content in the Manual of Clinical Microbiology, the Clinical Microbiology Procedures Handbook, and Cases in Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, please visit clinmicronow.org and click subscribe. And finally, before we close, a friendly reminder that the recording of this presentation will be emailed to you within a few days. And with that, we're going to thank our presenters again, and we will close this webinar. Thank you, Heba and Ben, for joining us today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you for the organization. Bye.